shortly now i would like to request our patron honorable principal dr minal kanti chattopadhyay to inaugurate this program with his kind words sir please namaskar sakal ke shubho sakal devi pokkho shuru hoye geche amra matri aradhonar jonno shobai obekkha korchi sakaler i susastho আমরা কামনা করছি হাত থেকে আমরা যাতে রক্ষা পাই সেই প্রার্থনা আমরা করছি আজকে খুব ভালো লাগছে যে ইংরেজি বিভাগের তরফ থেকে দুদিনের যে স্পেশাল লেকচার সিরিজের আয়োজন করা হয়েছে এতে আমরা আশা করি যে আমাদের ছাত্রছাত্রীরা অনেকখানি উপকৃত হবে এবং সব থেকে যেটা ভালো লাগছে আজকের যিনি অনুষ্ঠানের মূল বক্তা তিনি আমাদের অত্যন্ত প্রিয়জন ডক্টর সুকৃতি ঘোষাল তিনি ইংরেজি সাহিত্যের একজন খ্যাতিরামা অধ্যাপক এবং অবশ্যই একজন সফল প্রশাসক আমাদের সৌভাগ্য যে তিনি আমাদের কলেজে অনেকবার এসেছেন এবং তার সাহচর্যে আমরা অনেকবারই সমৃদ্ধ হয়েছি এবং আমার ছাত্রছাত্রীদের আজকে চরম সৌভাগ্য যে তার মতো তার মতো একজন বিদগ্ধ পণ্ডিত তিনি আজকে আলোচনা করবেন এবং আমাদের ছাত্রছাত্রীরা অনেক উপকৃত হবে এটা আমাদের খুব ভালো লাগছে আমি আর সময় নষ্ট করতে চাই না ছাত্রছাত্রীরা ডক্টর ঘোষালের লেকচার তারা শুনবেন এবং যেটা খুব ভালো ব্যাপার যে ব্রিটিশ পোয়েট্রি নিয়ে তিনি বলবেন ব্রিটিশ যুগের মাধ্যমে uh thank you sir actually we are feeling sorry that we have to miss you in this uh special lecture thank you sir for encouraging us always to organize this kind of uh, special lectures for students with your paternal support and guidance now i will move on to the next phase of the program our respected speaker will be speaking on the poetry of w yes WBH stands at the turning point between the Victorian period and modernism. Interestingly, Yeats straddles the line between romanticism and modernism in his poetry. There is no gainsaying of the fact that Yeats displays many of the characteristics of modernist uh, disenchantment in his poems. the conflicting currents of uh, modernism affected his put often yet cast himself as an enemy of modernism and modernist put yet boldly asserts i quote we are the last romantics yet repeatedly flogs the modernist poets for their sordidness of construction and flatness of diction yet one might venture to argue that there is not a single feature that yet ascribes to modern poetry that cannot be found in his own books yet fights modernism as hard as he could only to find himself acknowledging that he was a modernist to the marrow of his bones but this paradox is itself typical for for modernism often travels a road as far as it will go only to wind up in some exactly opposite place so i'm sure uh, dr goshal will probe deep into these conflicting issues while uh, delivering his lecture uh, before i invite him i will introduce him to the listener 
is my privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Goshal. Uh, he is former principal of MUC Women's College, Ordoman. He has recently retired from his service. He is renowned as distinguished scholar of English literature. He wrote several books like War Poetry, The New Sensibilities, and the Theories Underrated, uh, Oscar Wilde, the critic. To his credit, he has many publications as well, to name a few. Dismissing with a smile, a postcolonial comic subversion, the educational thoughts of Sami Vivekananda, a review, the language of Gitanjali, the paradoxical matrix, and so on. He has received the prestigious award of Sikharadno by the government of West Bengal for his immense contribution in the field of uh, education. We are we are very lucky, sir, to have uh, you with us. Uh, now I will request Dr. Ghoshal to begin his lecture. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Vidhan, for introducing me. Uh, thank you for your kind words. I don't know whether I really deserve that. Not as much. I mean, 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 I আন্তরিক শ্রদ্ধা জ্ঞাপন করছি আমাকে এই স্পেশাল লেকচারে সিরিজ অফ লেকচারস আমি যতটুকু বুঝতে পেরেছি তার একwidetilde বলবার সুযোগ করে দেওয়ার জন্য মানে আমার সম্পর্কে যে সমস্ত বিশেষণ বর্ষিত হলো আমি জানি না তারা যোগ্য কিনা সেটা যারা বললেন সেটা তাদের বিবেচনা তবে আমার নিজে ছাত্র ছাত্রীদের সঙ্গ ভালো লাগে এবং সাহিত্যে বিভিন্ন বিষয় নিয়ে আলোচনা করতে ভালো লাগে স্পেশাল লেকচার যখন বলা হচ্ছে স্পেশাল লেকচারে দু রকম ভাবে আমরা দেখতে পারি একটা হচ্ছে যে বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় আমি বলবার বা রাখা এখানে চেষ্টা করব তা মূলত ছাত্র ছাত্রীদের উপযোগী করি এটা বলার চেষ্টা করব কিছুটা হয়তো এট দি কস্ট অফ ওভার সিম্পলিফিকেশন মানে অনেক জিনিস আছে যেগুলো খুব বিতর্কিত এবং যা নিয়ে অনেক দীর্ঘ আলোচনা দরকার হয় কিন্তু সে আলোচনার স্কোপ নেই কারণ এখানে প্রথম কথা স্কোপ নেই কারণ অল্প সময় আর দ্বিতীয় কথা হচ্ছে এক অর্থে দেখতে গেলে 3 ঘন্টাটা খুব অল্প সময় নয় কিন্তু এই 3 ঘন্টার মধ্যে তে WBS মডার্নিজম এবং হচ্ছে তার দুটো কবিতা যেটা অবশ্যই ছাত্রছাত্রীদের প্রতীক্ষা থাকবে তাদের আশা থাকবে যে কবিতা দুটোকে একটু আলোচনা করা হোক সেই আলোচনা করতে গেলে যে সময়টা চলে যাবে তাতে অন্য বিষয় নিয়ে বিশদ আলোচনা করার স্কোপ থাকবে না তাই আমি সবই নয় আমাকে যে আমন্ত্রণ জানানো হয়েছে সেজন্য আন্দ্রা রাধাকান্ত কুন্ডু মহাবিদ্যালয়ের সংশ্লিষ্ট সমস্ত অধ্যাপক অধ্যাপিকা এবং অধ্যক্ষ এবং তাদের পরিচালন সমিতির সকলকে আমার কৃতজ্ঞতা জ্ঞাপন করছি এবং ছাত্রছাত্রীদেরকে বলছি যে আমি যেটা আজকে আলোচনার মধ্যে রাখার চেষ্টা করব সেটা আমি যতটুকু WBS পড়ে এবং বিভিন্ন সময় WBS এর বিভিন্ন কবিতা পড়িয়ে আমার যেটা উপলব্ধি সেটা কি একটু সাজিয়ে বলার চেষ্টা করছি হয়তো এখানে মৌলিকতা তত বেশি খুঁজলে তারা হতাশ হতে পারে কিন্তু আমি আমার মত করে এটাকে রাখার চেষ্টা করছি নাও ওভার টু দি টপিক Students, if you um, 
read the history of English literature, then you will find that, first of all, the topic is modernism in British poetry with special reference to W.B. Yeats and his two poems, The Second Coming and Lida and the Swan. So this is what I have been given to understand that uh, you know, the lecture should be focused on this particular area. Now, anybody who knows the, or st has studied the history of English literature, knows that W.B. Yeats was born in 1865 and he died in 1939. And the first point that I want to stress is that WBS has much in common with our great poet, Robin North Tagore. Tagore was born in 1861. You should uh, keep in mind the year of his birth, 1861, the year in America, the civil war, civil war between the North and the South for the um, abolition of slavery that started. Uh, and Tagore died in 1941 when the Second World War was continuing. And um, W.B.S. died in 1930. Nine, the year the Second World War started. W.B. Yeats uh, was born in 1865, the year Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, and the year slavery was abolished from America. Now, Yeats has been, now there are other parallels between. Robinard Tregor and W.B. Yes. One is uh, both of them, both W.B. Yes and Robinard Tregor, both of them were awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. As you know, that Tregor received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913, and W.B. Yes was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923. And there is also one relation. In fact, it was W.B. Yes who had uh, strongly recommended the writings of Rabindranath Tagore to the readers of literature in the West. The Gitanjali, a poor word, you know, famous poor word, uh, or introduction written by W.B. Yes, and that had made Tagore, a celebrity, a very powerful poet, it was universally acknowledged on account of WBS, and that might have some connection to uh, the prestigious event of Tagore being awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Then another point of similarity is that both Tagore and WBS both of them began as a romantic, but gradually emerged as quote unquote modern. Modern is a very uh, deceptive term, I will come to that. But if we accept that modernism uh, is a terminology to be used with reference to certain authors, British authors writing in the first half of the 20th century, then uh, the features that we can find uh, in this description, modern, these features are found in the writings of W.B. Yes as well as Robin North Tagore. Vidhan Babu has rightly pointed out that sometimes it is said that yes is not a full-fledged modern poet. He is one of the last romantics. And whether he is a modernist, there is a debate. Uh, uh, you know, 
it is debated. In fact, not only yes, but uh, there are books by this particular that modernism is whether it is a uh, departure from the previous tradition or it is a continuity in a different form of the romantic tradition. There are books on that. I am not going into the details of the books. But let us accept that Tagore and yes, both of them started as uh, of them started as a romantic and gradually as they continued to light, write uh, another similarity is both of them had a long poetic career very long poetic career and both of them um, began as a romantic and continued to change their styles and matured and emerged as a uh, modern poet. Another point of similarity is that both of them, for example, had experienced and had been, let us say, shocked by the developments of the first world war and also modernism. Now, let me uh, try to uh, explain points here on the term modern. The term modern is, a, uh, uh, is to be used very uh, carefully. in his time. Shakespeare was modern in his time. So modern has a relation to time, to the temporal, uh, let us say, space. Modern has a relation to that. So, but in that sense, when we talk about modern English poetry or modernism in English, uh, British literature, we don't use that term in that sense. It means something... Uh, extra or supra-temporal, we mean extra or something going beyond temporality, something going beyond the time scale, this is what we have in mind. That is why uh, it has something to do with certain features of style. These features of style and the features of also uh, some thematic features that we will try to identify in course of this lecture. Uh, which will help us uh, uh, understand what precisely is meant by the term modern. When we uh, uh, discuss the poetry of, say, Hopkins or the poetry of, uh, say, Browning, Browning and Hopkins, they were uh, modern in, a, in the new sense of the term as well. That means uh, they were modern in the sense that they were much ahead of their time, they wrote in a style which is not, uh, cannot strictly be related to their own time. So it was, if Hopkins was smartly modern, if Browning was smartly modern, then modern does not refer to the period, the historical period uh, that uh, it is, uh, uh, to which it is associated, that is, uh, uh, with which it is associated, that is the early part of the 20th century. So, mostly it is the early part of the 20th century. Modern, um, uh, we may say, roughly say that from 1910 to 1950, uh, maybe uh, that, is a, that will give you a rough idea because um, the style and the aspects, the attitude to life went uh, on changing uh, after that. So, roughly the literary output of the historical period 1910 to 1950, let us say. Uh, so, this is the time period we should associate with the term, uh, to de uh, we should uh, use the term uh, modern to describe the literary output of this particular period. But, it is not 
strictly period related, which means that anyone, any time in the history of British literature who embody or whose writings embody these features may be uh, described as modern, though, or rather, uh, there is an anticipation of this, uh, these stylistic features in their writings, though, strictly speaking, they are not, uh, the, the literary historians do not describe them as modern writers. Now, why is this term used modern? Why do we uh, use a new term at all? Actually, you know that if, if you read the history of English literature, uh, the early part of the 19th century is called the Romantic period. The great romantics, Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, Coldidge, etc. That was uh, their, uh, so their writing, somehow it differed from any new terminology. This you should keep in mind, students any new terminology used in um, the history of literature uh, is required to uh, distinguish the literary output of that particular period from what has gone before. So the Romantics introduced a new form of writing or rather they are topics, they are mode of presentation, etc., differed a lot from the neoclassical type of um, um, writing. Um, the 18th century uh, poetic style, that's why the term romantic was brought into use. Similarly, the Victorians who followed the romantics, now Victorian Queen Victoria, her reign, this is the time, the Victorian period. Now, it also, it was a, in certain uh, aspects, it shows a continuity of the romantic, uh, let us say, themes and romantic style, but it also introduced certain new aspects. That's why a new term is used to describe it from what has gone before. Similarly, the term modern is used to distinguish the literary output of the early 20th century from the literary output of the Romantic Victorian period. So it is therefore suggestive of a departure from the poetic tradition, pre-modern poetic tradition. So modern this term is used to indicate a departure from the pre-modern poetic tradition. Now, what do we mean by that? Let me try to um, uh, mention some of the uh, some of the features. For example, nature orientation. This is a romantic feature. And in modern poetry, we find the focus is on town and the urban life, not nature in, is in focus, but town and the urban life is in focus in modern poetry. Insofar as love is concerned, love, the romantic still, um, let us say, believed in. There are themes of betrayal uh, and rejection, etc. In um, That is also there in, uh, let us say, romantic love poetry. But in modern poetry, we find that the people are as if in quest for love, as if love has disappeared. And love is less an emotional affair and more something to do with sex, this is what we find in modern poetry. So thematically, this is how, so, or say, insofar as religious faith is concerned, the romantics, they, and even the Victorians, uh, you find that uh, Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, where Matthew Arnold despairs, or rather 
laments for the uh, waning of faith, uh, the gradual erosion of faith. But the Romantics, uh, they uh, believed in uh, religion. Religion gave a consolation to their mind in times of their emotional crisis. But there is uh, an absence, not only erosion. Erosion of faith is characteristic of Victorian. There is an absence of faith is characteristic of, uh, you know, uh, modern literature. As if faith has disappeared, and that's why Eliot wrote uh, the Hollow Man, the Westland, you know. Um, the second point that you should, now when you depart from one tradition, you depart from that tradition in many aspects. For example, romantic poetry uh, is fond of idealizing something, be it the song of the nightingale or the healing power of nature, as we find in the poetry of William Wordsworth. So it is, it has, its matrix is in idealism. It is some personal faith, some personal, uh, let us say, uh, faith in some uh, ideal world that inspires romantic poetry. But modern poetry is much more realistic. That means it is not indifferent to the evils of life. So you know that when I say that romantic poetry is idealist, what do I mean? It means that there are uh, good and evil coexist in life, but the romantics are eager to express the good and suppress the evil. But the romantic, the modern poets, the modern poets, they are eager to, uh, uh, they are not indifferent to the evils of life, but rather they are not eager to suppress evil, but to express it. Maybe there was a, uh, uh, this modern poetry uh, was inspired by the writings of uh, Baudelaire. Baudelaire, you know, is a French poet. And Baudelaire wrote, Le Flou du Mal, the powers of evil. How evil can also be the source of uh, uh, power, that is some great poetic uh, uh, expression. That is uh, not only theorized, but that is also practiced in uh, by Baudelaire. So the modern poets, therefore, they are not willing to suppress or bypass evil, but to express it. Whatever, by evil, I mean all the negative aspects of life, which were as if to some extent wished away in romantic poetry. These are, uh, let us say, very strongly present and they are uh, foregrounded in modernist writing. Then the issue of the individual. The individual was related to society and the um, individual was not projected as uh, standing alone from society, standing away or uh, aloof from society. What we call alienation. Alienation is uh, uh, characteristically modern. Projection of alienation, emphasis on alienation. And you know, this alienation has something to do with the city-centeredness. Because in a town, when you uh, uh, migrate from your own village and start living in a town, then you become accustomed to a culture uh, which is uh, expressive of your uh, uprootedness. I have measured out my life with coffee spoon, as J. Alfred Tupac says in uh, the love song of J. Alfred Tupac by T.S. Eliot. So this uprootedness is characteristically modern alienation of an individual, the silent suffering of an individual. And this is, uh, and you know, alienation, the sense of, uh, let us say, your distance from the society, this is uh, uh, psychologically oriented as well. And maybe 
uh, some influence of Freud here, you may trace, and Freud's influence, of course, uh, is more, much more felt in uh, the, uh, in, insofar as literature is concerned, in the uh, change of uh, narrative style from the uh, traditional storytelling pattern to the stream of consciousness pattern, as you find in the writings of uh, Virginia Woolf or the modernist uh, novelist. Then another aspect of uh, modern poetry, I'm here counting the um, thematic aspects first, and then I'll uh, come to the um, you know, stylistic aspects. So the point that I made uh, is that, that it is, it is uh, the modern poets, they are very sensitive to what is happening around. It is critical outlook on social conditions, not adhering to a vision within. So adhering to a vision within, this is characteristic of romantic literature, be it the writings of Wordsworth who believed in the healing touch of nature, uh, always they would adhere to a vision as if their poetry is inspired by a vision. Blake's poetry was in, inspired by a vision that he carried in the heart of his horse. So you look inwards and then you are inspired to write poetry and you give expression to your own ideas. But in modern poetry, you find a critical outlook on the social conditions. You are not oblivious of the social conditions. And those of you who have read the mature poems of, or later poems of uh, Rabindranath Tagore, you know what I mean. Awareness of critical outlook on social conditions, this is also characteristic of modern poetry. Then another aspect is that uh, we are actually moving from uh, the thematic to the uh, let's say stylistic aspects that in modern poetry or rather if romantic Victorian poetry is more emotional, modern poetry is less emotional and more cerebral. Cerebral means related to the uh, uh, brain. That is, you will have to read a poem not only with your heart, but activating your intellectual, uh, say, uh, that, that, that intellect part of in your brain, that is to be activated. That means you have to apply both your head and your heart to read and comprehend a modern poem. So um, romantic poetry, you could just be absorbed in the poem because it is all emotional. But Roman, um, modern poetry, you will have to apply, take the help of your brain as well. That means you have to, maybe when you start reading the uh, poetry of T.S. Uh, Eliot, for example, or of W.H. Auden, then you have to um, take the help of, a, uh, of an encyclopedia without that, or Isra Pound, without an encyclopedia, without a reference book, you cannot just uh, grasp what is being communicated by the poet in that poem. So as it is more cerebral, as it is less emotional, it tends to be apparently very obscure. Obscure, less easy reading. Obscure is a term uh, obscurity is a feature of modern poetry, uh, it is said. But mind it that when you read WBS, WBS's poetry, WBS is a very uh, interesting modern poet whose poetry is uh, uh, not so much cerebral, not so much, uh, you need not so much take the help of, a, of an encyclopedia to read and comprehend the poetry of WBS and uh, how or why WBS too is to be uh, described as a 
modern poet. I will come to that point later on. But let me first enumerate or try to enumerate some of the very uh, important features of modern poetry. Obscurity. Now, obscurity is a um, pejorative term, means which is uh, not to be uh, considered as a quality of good writing, but it is uh, uh, as if uh, it, it, it is in. Uh, it is not. Uh, Rather, if poetry is obscured, then the readers, they are scared away and they do not find any interest in reading it. But the modernists, they, now modern and modernist, let me um, uh, make clear the difference. You are a modern poet uh, because uh, when you have your poetry is marked by the features that is found in modern poetry. But you are a modernist when you are consciously and very, uh, let us say, programmatically when you uh, uh, depart from the earlier poetic tradition. So modernist is a very stronger term when there is a conscious interrogation of the previous, of the um, features of uh, foregoing poetic tradition. When you consciously depart from that, when you raise your poetry as, the, as an antithesis to that, then uh, uh, you are a modernist. Now, WBS was not uh, uh, a modernist in that sense of the term. T.S. Eliot or Isra Pound might be modernist. That means they consciously rejected that tradition. But WB, in WBS, we find a gradual evolution as if he found the earlier poetic uh, form of expression inadequate and that's why he changed his style and he embraced the new type of poetry uh, catering to the, uh, let us say, readers of his own time, writing in a new style, but conscious rejection. Yes, WBS says that uh, uh, when fools have taken my coat, let them take it. I there is more enterprise in walking naked. That is a uh, determination. That is a conscious, uh, let us say, selection of a new style. But this conscious selection of a new style does not mean that yes, he is very, um, you know, very consciously he is raising his poetry as an antithesis to uh, uh, pre-modern poetry. Uh, in that sense, uh, therefore. Uh, ESS poetry is less cerebral, less obscure, but obscurity nevertheless is considered as one of the uh, features of modern poetry. And why is modern poetry obscure? Obscure for two, three reasons. One is uh, absence of linear narrative. If you read what was Tintern Abbey or uh, Paul Ridge Ensign Medina or uh, Kirsten's Ode to a Nightingale, from the first line to the last line, there is a, a linear movement as if uh, stanza to stanza, the um, idea is progressing linearly, li linearly. But in modern poetry, the as T.S. Eliot himself has said, that the uh, there is a suppression of links in the chain. So not that there is a uh, movement, not that the poem is not a whole. Eliot elsewhere says that it is a heap of broken images. There is fragmented images are dished out together and you have to grasp the significance of the poem by uh, responding to individual images that uh, you come across in the body of the poem. So, heap of broken images, no doubt, but there is a suppression of links in the chain. Conscious, we may say, add conscious suppression of links in the chain, which makes them very hard to um, for our reading and for our interpretation as well. Another uh, thing that may be ascribed to, uh, let us say, uh, modernism is uh, the imagist. Uh, is, let us say, modern poetry, modern English poetry is, uh, it has some relation with uh, imagism. And you know, 
uh, what is imagism? Actually, imagism developed or flourished as a kind of reaction to Parnassianism um, um, in French literature. Uh, this actually, uh, um, you know, uh, I would say that not image, first of all, symbolism. Let me uh, start with that. Symbolism is a reaction to Parnassianism in French literary tradition. And Parnassianism advocated strict adherence to form. And the symbolists oppose the realist. The symbolists oppose the realist, but images. Ezra Pound, in fact, edited a uh, um, volume, The Images. It is a, a book of poems. Uh, it was first appeared in 1914, as far as I can remember. There, uh, now, they are advocating a form of poetry which, where the poem itself is actually, um, uh, is an, uh, it is nothing but a garland of images. Now, uh, many you doubt or rather uh, question the use of the metaphor garland because it is not garland like, because flowers are strewn all over the poem without being threaded together into one poem. But uh, image, an image is what is an image before imagism? Let me come to the very concept for the students. What is an image? An image is uh, considered. Uh, uh, let us say, a verbal picture, a picture made of words or drawn with words. So as you draw a picture with colors, when you draw a picture with words, then it becomes an image. Now, great poetry, as it is always held, that great poetry always is nothing but the translation of an idea into an image. That is, it is a it, under, it is marked by a, uh, you have to, when the poet speaks, when the poet expresses, he tries to transform his idea uh, into an image. So, Name Sondha Tondra Losha Sona Rachol Khosha or Sondha Rage Jhili Mili Jhilome Shrot Khani Banka Aadhare Molin Holo Jano Khape Dhaka Banka Talwar etc. etc. such words. All these are examples of how an idea is expressed by drawing a picture, whatever big the picture. Now, mind it that uh, the taste of an image is not so much in its originality, but in its um, appropriateness. And more so, or rather, more than that, in its power of illumination of the idea that is being expressed. So the test of success of an image is not less in its originality, but more in its appropriateness and its power to, uh, let us say, power of illumination. Illumination of what of the idea that is dwelt upon. So a poet tries to present an idea and how that idea is embodied into an image that is the success of great poetry. And the image is thought that images should be pearl-like, crystalline images. And a poem would be nothing but a collection of images, as if a number of images are uh, let's say, sometimes strewn together, sometimes they are scattered all over the body of the poem. And this gives you something like a cubist painting. Uh, uh, a number of cubes give you the form of a, uh, of a human form or an animal form, something like that. So this is uh, one stylistic. So the modernist poets, they preferred uh, to present their thoughts in terms of images rather than um, using image, not that in romantic poetry there is no image, not that in Victorian poetry there is no image. Yes, 
there are images but images are uh, fewer in number and more sometimes uh, more uh, let us say decorative than functional in uh, pre modern poetry but the modern poets they use uh, uh, they speak in terms of they express their ideas in terms of images this may be the uh, due to the impact of images in, on the um, sensibility of the modern poets and the last stylistic feature that i would um, um, want to point out this also distinguishes modern poetry um, from pre modern poetry that the modern poets they wanted to um, um, they were insisting upon the abandonment of uh, rhyme as well this rhyme well w b s used rhyme in his poetry and he did not um, uh, let us say agree with the uh, contemporary let us say co writers uh, co poets in so far as the abandonment of uh, you know rhyme is concerned but modern poets they prefer to write in what is called free verse the french term is ver liber v e r s l i b r d liber is liberated and verse is what we call uh, poetry poem so poetry as if liberated from the fetters of from the chains of uh, meter so if you use you know, meter is there meter rhythm is there in every poetry but fetters of rhyme poetry is liberated from the fetters of rhyme as if so rhymeless uh, what you call prose poems that is also quite natural that actually was introduced by the uh, modern poets and it has become uh, so much characteristic of uh, our time that we never find for the absence of rhyme um, though even uh, contemporary poets many contemporary poets in bengali in english in uh, many other languages they do prefer to write in verse now w b s never Uh, uh he was very uh, facile uh, in creation of rhyme and he uh, therefore we may say what we call born poets he belong to that category and that's why if a free verse be the characteristic the only characteristic of uh, modernism then w b s is certainly not a modernist poet now let me uh, sum up the points that i have tried to make uh um, to you know we may put three let us say uh, issues under three heads one is romantic the second is modern and the third is postmodern so why postmodernism is required postmodernism i am not going to comment on or rather discuss postmodernism here nor do i have that much of expertise but as i understand it i also want to refer to post modernism because so modern period stands between so um, on the it stands between romanticism and post modernism so if modernism stands between romanticism and post modernism then to understand its uh, unique position we should distinguish it or, or rather we would be able to better understand its distinct position if we um, can relate it somehow or rather distinguish it from uh, romanticism and postmodernism say romantics they um, were let us say their life is society bound or rather collective experience modernism you find alienation man as an individual man as if uh, uh, you, you know cut off from uh, the company of 
people who move around him and if alienation is uh, lamented in alienation is uh, projected as a uh, as a kind of let's say condemned destiny of modern people if alienation is uh, you know as i told you expressed as a, a condemned destiny of unavoidable destiny of a modern of modern life alienation is celebrated in postmodern poetry or postmodern literature so alienation is lamented the agony of alienation is expressed in modern poetry but there is a celebration of alienation in uh, postmodern poetry so the romantics they believed in or rather the the cult of heroism heroes they uh, are glorified for example prometheus on board there must be a prometheus someone with extraordinary capability to change extraordinary capacity to impact society so hero as we understand the term prometheus like figa this is romantic and in modern poetry we have figures like prophoc j alfred prophoc who wants to uh, make love but who doesn't have the courage or the confidence to face the women um, to whom uh, he should propose so if this be if prophoc is a modern hero at least prophoc has some kind of prophoc is not a hero in the uh, romantic sense of the term he is an anti hero in that but in postmodern literature for example in tom stoppard's uh, play rosenkan and grildenstern are dead now rosenkan and kranz and grildenstern they are two characters in minor characters in minor figures in shakespeare's play uh, uh, hamlet they have been the minor figures have been projected as heroes so gone are the days of great heroes gone are the days of uh, hercules and of prometheus but we have in our time very minor figures uh, 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 clownish figures as heroes so this is what you find in post modern literature then modern period or rather romantic period or even before that say uh, um, uh, you have masterpieces for example uh, what's was the prelude or milton's uh, milton wrote in the 17th century mind it not in the 19th century milton's paradise lost and in modern um, you know what is the masterpiece of modern literature modern english literature the westland ts elias the westland it is a masterpiece now it is uh, a grand narrative in the sense that it is a commentary on the situation of the modern people so various aspects of life uh, loveless sex urban uh, sordidness the uh, rootlessness of the dwellers of town etc etc all these and the uh, our nostalgia for uh, what is lost etc all these found in Uh, uh, it is a kind of modern epic as it so it is not an epic in the sense paradise lost is an epic but nevertheless it is an epic of our time but in postmodern time we find a skepticism for uh, the grand narrative grand narrative what does that mean that something that can epitomize all the conditions of your society so as if if westland epitomizes the condition of life in england in the early part of the 20th century the postmodern thinks that uh, writers they are skeptical about that that is there is not a single no narrative all these are uh, uh, nar- maybe narratives but grand narrative something that epitomizes all aspects something that covers every uh, aspect of your lived experience that is uh, uh, actually characteristically postmodern so uh, if beauty is found in romantic literature 
terrible beauty is characteristic of uh, modern literature and distortion of beauty. As if Tagore um, presented, the Tagore song presented with, uh, in a jazz-like style, this is characteristic of postmodern uh, uh, literature. Then literature, it was believed in the Romantic period that any poem, it will have a single aspect. And the poets, the, you know, the poet as if wants to communicate his own experience, his own idea, and that idea we should try to grasp. So only single fixed meaning. Modern period, we find that there are multiple meanings. There are various ways of responding to a poetic uh, image. And uh, in postmodern time, all the meanings are equally valid. Even something that cannot be directly related to the words in which the idea is embedded. That is, you know, deconstructive reading of uh, a poem is also possible. So it is uh, possible. And then... Linear narrative is characteristic of uh, romantic literature. Fragmented presentation is characteristic of modern literature. And postmodern, as if something is left unfinished. So you need not finish it. You leave it unfinished and let the uh, readers come forward and to uh, try to interpret. Now, what about WBES? Uh, as the point was raised, W.B. Yes, was he a, just a last romantic or was he a modern poet as well? I told you that, uh, you know, romantic or modern or postmodern or any such term, when we use them, they are applicable broadly. But a poet who writes, a poet who composes uh, various, you know, if your literary output, if you are a prolific writer, then you have written so many things. And uh, some antithetical note is also to be found. And there have been scholarly writings on how modernism is maybe shown or maybe established as a continuity of romanticism as well. So my point is, uh, let, us, let us consider that modern is a term that can be applied to describe and to specify the features of writing of the early 20th century British literature. And this term should be used because the writings of this period, they have some features. Maybe that all the features are not present in all the poets. Maybe Eliot's poetry is obscure and Eliot's poetry is not obscure. Maybe uh, uh, Eliot preferred to write, uh, make use of the free verse and Eliot was not interested in writing in free verse, that is, uh, uh, um, that is to be admitted. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we should uh, keep in mind that, um, we should keep in mind that uh, this period uh, has certain features which may be traced to the writings of WBES as well, or rather, to put it differently, WB, yes, is in temper. He is a modernist, though he, uh, his style, the style of his mature poetry, of his later poetry, um, uh, it is uh, very close to the style of the Romantics and uh, distant from the style of the uh, other modernist poets like, uh, let us say, uh, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, or W.H. Uh, w. Auden. So, uh, E.S.'s style, uh, in, in his poetry, E.S. makes use of rhyme. He rhymed verse he preferred, and he was very facile in 
composing rhymed verse. But his style, if you study it, it also evolved and matured and uh, catered to the expectations of readers who are uh, exposed to the writings of T.S. Eliot and uh, w, uh, yeah, Ezra Pound, very critical, obscure type of poetry where links in the chain are consciously withdrawn. It, you know, when readers who were exposed to that and who accepted that as a, a style, a poetic style, even those readers, they uh, found interest in the writings of uh, WBS. So, they say, therefore, it would be wrong to say that in style, yes, was a traditionalist. No, yes, was a traditionalist in the insofar as he had a preference for, uh, let us say, uh, rhymed verse, but his style also uh, catered to the expectations of the more uh, readers who were um, um, very much, let us say, uh, exposed to the obscure, critical, cerebral uh, uh, pre-verse written by T.S. Eliot uh, and Ezra Pound. But what I uh, want to point out here, uh, this point that I want to add here at the beginning, that Yes's poetry, uh, Yes was responsive to the uh, issues of his time, the reality of his time finds expression in his verse and um, historical consciousness is uh, one important feature of ESS poetry relating the personal to the historical. This is one feature of ESS poetry and so if you are only personal, then you are romantic. But when you, yes, yes uh, you know, uh, yes, in all his poems, almost he uh, talks about himself, his own attitude. But his own attitude is not uh, isolated from the social consciousness. So social consciousness, historical awareness, this is what uh, uh, makes Yes's poetry, Yes's verse, realistic enough, and as it is realistic, and as it is tipped in contemporary society, and as the personal is related to the social or to the historical condition, therefore, uh, you know, be it the uh, early poetry of Yes, where Yes is uh, stripped in Irish, uh, the glorious past of. Uh, Ireland, the Celtic twilight mood, as it is said, or yes, just mature poetry, where yes, uh, let us say, comments on September 1913 or Easter 1916, or uh, let us say the second coming that we are going to read. So, yes, just poetry is, uh, in a sense, it is uh, uh, one important aspect of yes, just poetry is that unlike romantic poetry, which is, uh, uh, let's say, a personal utterance, a private utterance of the poet. The private, of course, is said egotistical sublime. So, if Wordsworth's uh, poetry is egotistical, there is a touch of sublimity in it. But uh, yes, also starts with his uh, uh, personal issues, be it his relation to Mordgon, uh, but he nevertheless always uh, proceeds to comment on contemporary society and holds a critical outlook, outlook on the contemporary social uh, conditions. This is what uh, makes ESS poetry uh, modern in the true sense of the term. This is my humble submission. So I have uh, discussed at length the um, issues, some of the, not all the, but some of the issues of modernism. And I have done this to, uh, as I uh, said, uh, to, uh, because the 
topic of today's seminar is modernism in, in British poetry with special reference to WBS. So modernism in British poetry, what we understand by modernism in British poetry, that I have tried to uh, explore. And uh, let me now try to um, uh, explain the uh, poems, The Second Coming and uh, The Leader and the Swan. These two poems have been prescribed for you already. Now, The Second Coming. First of all, uh, students, you should keep in mind that the second coming um, makes some expectation, creates some expectation in our heart if we keep in mind the uh, biblical uh, announcement about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Know that it is said that when Jesus was rising to heaven and all are looking at him and uh, you know, the, um, there, was a, uh, there was some announcement made by angels from the cloud that um, Jesus would come back. Jesus would come back and he would, uh, technically this is called reincarnation. In our, the Gita, also there is a verse, you know, Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya Glanir Bhavati Bharata Hori Obhutthanam Adharmasya Tad Atmanam Srijam Maham That means whenever there is a spread of evil, and then I uh, would be reincarnated. That means I would come back to, uh, as a savior of the world, I would come back to deliver the world from the clutches of evil. I'll create myself. I will be reborn. I will appear from age to age, I will appear whenever there will be a, let's say, whenever virtue will be annihilated, virtue will disappear from the world and vice will spread, then in order to destroy evil and Restore the virtuous process of life. I will come back and I will give you the aid. Sir, sir, sorry for the, interrupting. Khadija, please uh, mute yourself. The words of Lord Krishna in the promise made about the coming of Jesus. The second coming of what we call the second coming. The second is the conditions when Jesus will come back. It's when evil will spread. And the spread of evil and the evil, uh, the proliferation of evil, the destruction of good, etc. All these uh, conditions have been mentioned vividly in various books and various chapters of the Bible and the Gospels as well. And then, not only the condition and not only the, uh, let us say, promise, the prophecy about the second coming, but also the time, the time period. When will this second coming take place? It is held that, uh, it is held that, uh, let's say, you know, the uh, evil will, you know, evil, what is the source of evil? Satan, the devil. The devil, the Satan, he is, the Christians believe, is the source of evil. and. Uh, in Revelation book 20, it is said, I'm quoting, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. 
bound him for a thousand years. Mark the word, thousand years. He threw them, threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. So these thousand years you call uh, millennium. So thousand years. For thousand years, so this is so three things you should keep in mind. One is there is a clear prophecy of the second coming of Jesus. Jesus, who was the savior of the world, who was the deliverer of the world from the abyss of evil or abyss of darkness. And then there are some symptoms very easily commented upon. You know, the uh, writers of the Bible or the passages where various, uh, for example, the dimming of the sun, the disappearance of the moon, etc. These are some of the graphic, let us say, conditions. But the conditions of evil are not restricted to the uh, only heavenly bodies, the sun would dim and the, uh, let us say, moon would disappear. But also there are other conditions mentioned in the Bible, which are, which may be read as a kind of uh, symptom that the world is going to end and the end of the world means the thousand years. Uh, what is the duration? Duration thousand years and this is uh, uh, the uh, stage is all set for the second coming, for the reappearance of the Lord. So these th three things you should, these three things related to the Christian, let us say, thought process or that Christian mythology, theology, that you should keep in mind. One is the prophecy about the second coming of the Lord. Then the conditions which will, uh, uh, let us say, indicate that the stage is all set for the reincarnation of the Lord. And third is the duration. That is the time span. The time span is thousand years. Condition is spread of evil in all its form. So span is thousand years. Condition is spread of evil in all its multiple forms. And the third is the fulfillment of the promise of the second coming of the Lord to save the world to deliver the world from the clutches of Satan or devil or evil, whatever name you give to it. Now these, with these words, let us turn to the poem. Turning and turning in the widening jayat, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. So jayat is a very complex image. Um, you know, Something that moves and something that has a cone-like shape, C-O-N-E, cone-like shape. So something gyrating, something revolving or whirling, and something that has a cone-like shape. Cone-like shape means it's order a spiraling. You know, the bottom narrows down, and as you move upwards, the circumference expands. This is the image that you should keep in mind when you are approaching. So, Jayar is an image. Image of, imagine a revolving uh, spinning or gyrating uh, uh, a thing which is cone-shaped. That is, is uh, uh, the lower you go, it is uh, narrowed to a point and the upper you move as you go up the, uh, let's say, uh, gyre, the circumference will become wider. The two ends of the, let's say, two points of the circumference, they would be distant, uh, uh, be more and more distant from um, the opposites uh, would, uh, let's say, spread. Now, turning and turning in the widening gyre. So, yes, is imagining that the 
world is like a giant and the world is moving and as the world is moving how is it moving it is moving like a giant and widening giant means the circumference is becoming wider and wider it spread like a giant মানে একটা জায়ার মানে হচ্ছে তার তলাটা হবে ধরে নাও যে খুব মানে আমরা যেমন করে আইসক্রিমের ইয়ে খাই না যে অনেক সময় একটা সেই ব্রাউন রঙের একটা ইয়ে আইসক্রিম দেয় তার তলাটা দেখবে যে সরু কিন্তু যত ওপরে যাও ওপরটা বড় হয় তাহলে জায়ার যদি আমরা ধরি সেরকম একটা ইয়ে তাহলে ওপরটা যত ওপরে যাব তত বড় হবে ইফ জায়ার বি রেড অর টেকেন অ্যাজ এ symbol of or rather an image uh, of or uh, no an equivalent to our own time so starting point of the jaya the narrowest uh, bottom of the jaya as the jaya as you move up the circumference uh, spreads similarly the starting point is let us say the birth of jesus and one year two year 100 years 200 years 500 years and uh, 1000 years so moving and moving our history is moving our civilization is moving like a jaya and the more we uh, move away from the point of time when jesus was here the wider becomes the circumference and the circumference becomes wider means the uh, more distant is the space of uh, we occupy from our source so we are moving away and away from the source Now, if source means christian faith if source means the origin then we are running away hard hard away from the point of time we started with say the point of time is 1 ad the year jesus uh, uh, let us say uh, counted from the year of the birth of jesus christ 1 ad then 1000 uh, ad means the jayad you have moved 1000 years for 1000 years from the point you started with and therefore every year means at every movement uh, you are moving up and the circumference is spreading and you are detached from you are alienated from the source you are you are moving away and away from the source you started with and that is why this leads us to the second image the falcon cannot hear the falconer a falcon and falconer this is actually uh this image has been uh, interpreted in various ways if falcon falcon is a bird you know and in uh, british culture there was a time of um, let's say flying falcons the tie, uh, eyes of the falcon would be uh, stitched and it will be let loose and it will start flying it will go up and up and then the falconer would give a call to the falcon and the falcon would come back to its owner so this is a pretty simple uh, let us say bird flying image falcon falconer falconer is flying the falcon and the falcon is flying up and up and then falconer gives a call and the falcon comes back to its master now uh, if the eyes of the falcon are stitched as happens sometimes if the eyes are stitched then what happens you cannot know the height you have rose the falcon never knows the height it has rose so it will go up and up and up and the upper you are flying the painter will be the voice of the falcon and maybe a time will come when you own hear the voice of the falcon or at all and then you are flying in your own uh, joy 
and you are rising up and up and then a time will come when your wings will get tired and you won't have time to fly down to the master and will fall dead. So, uh, the falcon cannot hear the falcon. The falcon has uh, flown so high that the voice of the falconer is inaudible to the falcon. Now, if we, the falcon and falconer, they are two words. I told you that it's an image. If we think that how, if we in, try to interpret the image. So, man and God, devotee and Lord, relation. So, man is the falcon or the devotee is the falcon. And God, or let us say Lord, our Lord, the master of our soul, he is the falconer. So if you rise higher and higher still, then what happens? The voice of your master cannot reach to your heart. The result is your destruction. So man, yes, what yes, uh, let us say, has in mind is that our civilization is moving, deviating farther and farther away from the path, from the virtuous course, which is recommended to us by the Lord. And this is expressed through the image of a gyre moving, a gyre gyrating or revolving and caught in that gyre, turning and turning, moving and revolving, you are, uh, let us say, alienated from your Lord and the result of this alienation is inevitable destruction. It has been pointed out that, uh, let us say, there are various ways of uh, interpreting. Norman Jeffers, for example, interprets it as pride of intellect. That means we have become, we are so proud intellectually that we ignore the recommendations of the spiritual, let's say, uh, we are um, irresponsive to the spiritual impulses in our heart due to the rule of the pride of intellect, due to the pride of intellect and uh, not following the commandments. And the, uh, if we do not follow the commandments, then we must prepare ourselves for the uh, worst, that is the fatal consequences that the falcon faces when the falcon cannot hear the falconer. So uh, pride of intellect has made us uh, impervious to, indifferent to the religious lessons. So uh, whatever be the, uh, whichever way you uh, interpret it, the first two lines simply, uh, let us say, may be uh, expressed in this way that caught in the cycle of history, which is uh, getting more and, uh, let us say, more distant from the, um, from the courses recommended in the, um, uh, uh, in the scriptures, man has uh, been alienated from his Lord and this actually may be the cause of the destruction that the devastation that we cannot avoid. And what kind of destruction? What kind of uh, devastation that we must prepare ourselves for now that we have got alienated from the Lord? Yes, proceeds to comment on the contemporary condition. And these lines, they are not restricted to the, they do not have the biblical, biblical flavor only. They are historically, topically important as well. Now, topically important, the poem, The Second Coming was written in 1919. You know that the First World War had ended in 1918. 14 to 18, and the poem was printed in the Dial, and it appeared in Michael Robertson, The Dancer, which was published in 1921. Anyway, 
the 1919 england was devastated by the first world war england you know the first world war and the second world war just a uh, kind of let us say stray uh, reference that during the first world war it is said that uh, it is said that um, 85 lakhs people were affected and the second world war was much more devastating two crores of men lost their lives in uh, in uh, in russia alone in the second world war so 85 lakh was the casualty and the worst sufferer was of course united kingdom or great britain now there is uh, incidentally let me tell you that the first world war is a historical uh, let us say even that impacted every sphere of life of man all over the globe now it is not that the first world war is the only war that was fought um, before that so many uh, blood shed had taken place in human history but there is a difference difference is during the first world war the machine replaced the muscle science was brought into war service for example dynamite explosion poison gas and air raid britain had experienced that then it made it fearful indeed and during the second world war you know that atomic uh, atom bomb explosion of atom bomb so war is no longer for glorifying individual prowess so a man is uh, helpless before the machine individual prowess has no weightage at all in our time so this type of so england uh, now yes as i told you uh, in my introduction that historical consciousness it is historical consciousness close critical outlook on contemporary uh, conditions of life this is what makes yes's poetry more than something a subjective matter maybe it is yes who is uh, affected but he presents his own mood uh, by relating it to the historical contemporary historical condition and that's why his poetry uh, his utterance in a poem is not only his personal utterance it is also a kind of uh, a, a historical document things fall apart the center cannot hold things fall apart so uh, order is lost imagine that uh, we all are stuck to the soil of the earth because of uh, the gravitational pull imagine the absence of the gravitational pull we all will be uh, let us say uh, flung into the sky and we will all will um there will be no order everything will be in a mess so things fall apart the fragmentation is the characteristic of world and things fall apart in the post world uh, first world war situation you understand what it means all the values uh, they are uh, they have disappeared you do not know what to trust you do not know what to cling to things fall apart the center cannot hold the center religion or a grand uh, consolation that would give meaning bring meaning to life that is missing that is found missing the center cannot hold mere anarchy is loosed upon the world so this is a summing up of the kind of blood bath uh, experienced by the world during the Um, first world war mere anarchy is loose now why is yes commenting upon the conditions things fall apart the center cannot hold mere anarchy is loose upon the world the blood dim tide is loose as if it is not only anarchy but an anarchy that is also a sanguine anarchy as it is said blood dim tide 
Sanguine means colored by blood. So huge blood shed, huge loss of life is there. Blood dim tide is loose. Loose means as if someone had uh, previously, uh, uh, let us say, bound it by chain. But once the chain is, uh, 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 let us say, uh, taken away, and uh, once uh, human uh, primitive destructive instinct is uh, unfastened, it is, uh, let us say, uh, let us say, uh, released, then the Pandora's box, like opening the Pandora's box, all the evils will charge up. All the evils will uh, come to affect the civilized society. The blood dim tide is loosed. And everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. So not that there are, uh, yes, is no uh, cynic. Cynic, you know, cynic is one who doesn't, uh, who doesn't, have any faith in any idealism. Yes, so is no cynic. Yes, thinks that there are still some good people. But the good people, their voice is drowned. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. Nobody listens to during the first world war. There are there are pacifists who uh, agitated against the uh, blood dim tide that was loosed and people's life. The civilians were affected, but. Nobody is in a mood to listen to them. The best lack all convictions, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yes, also uh, complaints against the role of the people uh, whose voices should count, what we call the members of the civil society in our time. The civil society, they, the best lack all conviction, means they are, uh, uh, you know, trying to guide the world, no doubt. That means they are decrying the bloodshed of First World War, no doubt. But they cannot do that very assertively. That means they lack the conviction. Now, suppose I am telling you something, but I, uh, my voice, I cannot utter my words with, uh, uh, you know, with much emphasis. So best, like, this happens when you lack this conviction. You remember that uh, Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, what did he say? That, O oh Lord, they do not know what they are doing. Please forgive them. So Jesus had that conviction. That's why he allowed himself to be crucified. So conviction is you have to you risk your own life. The best people of our time, the uh, so-called members of the civil society of our time, they are sometimes giving us the warning signals, but they are very expedient in the expression of their attitude and they lack the conviction, the assertive energy, which will uh, act as a force to return or to check the spread of evil. That's why the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And the worst, the evil-minded people, they are uh, say, triumphing with all their fury because they have almost a cake walk because nobody is there to check the uh, check the uh, let's say fury, the, the triumph of fury in our time. So you find that these, uh, how do you relate these uh, uh, lines to the title of the poem, the second coming? Turning and turning in the widening jaya, the falcon cannot hear, the falconer things fall apart, etc., etc. So, yes, is first saying that the historical cycle is on the move and we are farther and farther away from the source. Farther and how far can you move or how long should you move? As I told in the beginning, that it is a cycle of 1,000 years. After that, there will be, maybe there would be uh, a possibility of the second coming, a thousand, period of 1,000 years. So we are moving away and away, farther and farther away from the uh, 
from the course recommended to us by the Lord. And as a result of this, the, how would you, I told you, how would you relate these lines to the main, uh, uh, to, to, to the title of the poem? I uh, told you that three things you should keep in mind at the prophecy or the promise of second coming. And the second is the uh, conditions which, uh, let us say, are indicative of the chance, the possibility of a second coming, and then the second coming itself. So these lines, uh, which are let's say, rooted in contemporary history, and not only yesterday's time, but since these are, uh, these may be, uh, let us say, described as a description of any time that is, uh, let us say, fallen, any time that is gone astray, any time that is misdirected and, let's say, deviating from the uh, civilized course of life, this is a summing up of that. And this summing up actually paves the way because the conditions have been created. So, yes, things that if this be the condition, if the best lack the convi conviction, if the worst are in their frenzy, if the ceremony of innocence is drowned, if bloodbath is the uh, uh, go of the day, if anarchy is found everywhere, if things fall apart and the centralizing force, the binding force is found missing, then all these achieve match with the description mentioned in the Bible, the description about when it is the uh, possible time for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, yes, thus, uh, uh, first gives us the condition, then he proceeds to examine or, um, let us say, express his expectation. Surely, some revelation is at hand. Surely. Surely. Why surely? Because the symptoms match. That means the world has a full, let us say, drink of all the evils mentioned in the Bible. And when all the evils, uh, let us say, reign supreme in the world, then it is the time for the incarnation of the Christ, of Christ. Surely, some revelation is at hand. Revelation in which form? Sure, revelation in the form of the second coming. Surely, the second coming is at hand with much expectation, with much, let us say, hope. Yes, utters these words that, well, if he will be made konikeer chiro diboshet surjo, if evil is so widespread, if vice is so widespread, if wrongs are so, uh, let us say, uh, so much dominant, then we must not lose our hope because there is a promise of the end of all wrongs at the end of the day with the appearance of, with the uh, uh, second coming of the Lord. The second coming is at hand. That means we must now prepare for, we must now celebrate the second coming. The world or the stage is all set for Jesus to get reincarnated. And what does his reincarnation mean? His re reincarnation means that he will fight all evil-minded people, he will deliver the world from the clutches of the devil and he will bring the world back to the course of virtue again as, uh, uh, let us say, it was at the beginning of history. The second coming, with much, let us say, eagerness, the poet utters this. And hardly are those words out when a vast image out of the spiritus mundi troubles my sight. I could hardly uh, 
you know, no sooner have I uh, uttered these words, then a fast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Now, so what is Spiritus Mundi? Spiritus Mundi, as you know, literally it means Mundi, you may relate it to Mundan. Mundan means worldly. So, Mandus means world. Spiritus Mundi means world spirit. This is nothing but uh, in Yesian frame of reference, it is a storehouse of images. As if all the images are stored there, something like Jung's racial memory, a storehouse of experiences, and uh, a universal memory in that sense. The collective soul of the universal, uh, of the universe, uh, that we call, maybe we may describe it as the collective memory. And you can, from that collective memory, take out one image or an image uh, uh, springs, an image, let us say, uh, comes out. And what is this image? This image is, uh, uh, this figure is uh, uh, described or depicted graphically in the next few lines. So, Spirit Rasmandi then, it is nothing but imagine a collective uh, a collection of images, a storehouse of images, from that Im storehouse, as if from the green room the actor comes, similarly from the storehouse of images, a vast image comes out. And this image, mark the word, troubles my sight. So, yes, is not at all pleased to look at the figure. So, he was expecting the reincarnation of Jesus. Now, if it is the second coming, would he say, it troubles my sight? He would say, it pleases my sight. So, the very word troubles my sight prepares us for what is to come. Troubles my sight means he feels perplexed. He feels vexed by the image that he can envision or that he visualizes. All this is not happening physically, but as if it is happening in the theater of his mind. He visualizes an image. What kind of image? So it is actually an extension of the imagination of uh, the um, uh, poet's, uh, poet's imagination. He says, somewhere in the sands of the desert, a, a shape with lion body and head of a man, a sphinx-like figure, lion body and head of a man. Now, what is the significance? He, in physical strength, it is brutish, lion's muscles. Lion's muscles means very uh, muscular and very powerful, and the head of man. So, lion may be uh, endowed with physical strength, but man still can. You know, the elephant is far more strong than man. But man can dominate and, and domesticate an elephant because man has the head. So, intellectual power is higher than the uh, physical uh, strength. But this figure, the shape that he has visualized, it is endowed with the physical strength of an animal and the intellectual power of a human, the head of a man, a gauge blank and pitiless as the sun. So, now physical body, if you are uh, uh, you're, you're endowed with intellectual power, but you have a frail physical body, then you won't be able to do much harm. Or if you have the huge muscular strength, but if you lack the power or the brain, the brain power, then also your, uh, your harming power will be, uh, harmfulness will be restricted. But this figure has both the physical uh, uh, strength and the intellectual shrewdness, we may say, uh, the power of the brain, a gauge, blank and pitiless as the sun. Now, physical power combined with the intellectual power that is, two powers combined, the huge strength, 
this huge strength could be a strength uh, for the uh, use of man, for the benevolence of man. But he says that a gauge blank and pitiless as the sun. That is, it is a malevolent force, not a benevolent force. It's a, it's gauge is blank and pitiless. That is, it is not going to have any human sympathy for anybody. Gauge blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs. Now the movement is described. So first the creature that is born, the creature that is born after a waiting of 2000 years, because he has wrote it in the 20th century. So after two millennia, so two millennia of waiting and then waiting for whom? Waiting for a benevolent force who will come and destroy evil and do good to humanity. And uh, uh, again, give us back the blessed days we started with at the beginning point of history. But this figure with animal strength and human brain power, with a gauge uh, which is lacking in sympathy, is moving its slow thigh. That means it is ready to, preparing to occupy the throne, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. So that it is not a benevolent force is clear from the movement of the desert birds. If the desert birds are also avoiding it, that means it is load, not only loathsome, but ferocious force. And the birds somehow they have a sense, they have a, a let us say, smelt that it is an evil force that is going to rule the root. And uh, uh, that's why the birds are reeling, uh, uh, the, uh, reeling around it over the sky, in the sky. The darkness drops again. So yes, first prepares us for the second coming in the first stanza. So all the evils, Evil is rampant and the widespread evil is suggestive of the, the time has matured. As if after 10 months time gestation is gone and uh, let us say now, uh, now evil uh, is going to end because God will reincarnate. God will, the second coming is at hand. But after uttering the word second coming, yes, uh, his vision is perturbed by, his vision is vexed by an image which has nothing to do with the calmly, all-forgiving, sympathetic, human uh, face of Jesus Christ, the Lord, the deliverer of the world, but an ugly, loathsome creature avoided by, even by the birds and it is, um, let's say, lacking in pity and endowed with the uh, bestial muscular strength and human intellectual power. That creature is moving its slow thighs, uh, that is preparing to occupy the throne. The darkness drops again, as if a dark veil uh, falls upon the poet's imagination. But now I know, that means from my, uh, from what the, uh, from what the vision of this image, loathsome creature has informed me. Now I know, means I am certain, that 20 centuries of stony sleep, 20 centuries, I told you, keep in mind the time span, one millennium, thousand years, for thousand years time, uh, you know, uh, the Satan will be uh, condemned to hell. The dragon will be restricted to the dark chamber of hell. But then after thousand years, it will spring its head. And 2000, after 2000 years, when the world is all uh, prepared for welcoming, uh, uh, hailing the Christ to come and occupy the throne and uh, be the, um, be the uh, uh, 
be the steerer of our heart, then that particular at that particular time, an anti-Christ image yet visualized. It is not a, it is not Christ who is coming, but an anti-Christ that is uh, born. Twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. Vexed to nightmare. That means these twenty centuries of stony sleep. It is not, uh, let us say, at the end of this sleep, you have a sweet dream. But all this is going to be devastated. All this is going to be turned not vexed by uh, to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast is our come round at last? It is time for the beast to come and rule. So when years was preparing for the, uh, let us say, second coming, then uh, second coming of Jesus, then instead of the second coming, we have uh, the, so the, our expectation, all our expectation is frustrated because someone else, some antichrist image is going to rule the world in the uh, following uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of years to come. So, we may hear the footsteps of uh, Hitler here, historically speaking, because at the end of the First World War, Hitler rose and Hitler was responsible for the Second World War, as you know. So, all our preparedness for the Second Coming that is turned to naught, vexed to a nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast is our come? Now, one thing I want to uh, I'll say, make clear. So, it is not clear uh, from the, um, let us say, frame of references in the poem whether this uh, rough beast, it is the new form of the Lord who will, uh, let us say, deliver us from evil, the new form like our Kolki of Avatar. So that Kolki, face of Kolki, is um, um, Koli, Koli, you know, at the end of uh, uh, Koli Jugo. Uh, the Kolki Avatar, you know, the uh, not a soothing, gracious face, but nevertheless, Kolki uh, will destroy the world so that new values could be uh, created, new values could, uh, can germinate. So the uh, destruction is required for creation. But this hope, this optimism is most probably not there. Not that the beast is simply a rough beast uh, in physical form, but it is ready to do good to humanity. I would rather like to say that it is like an antichrist, that means representing all the, uh, uh, let's say, embodying all that uh, uh, Christ was not. So humanity, love, affection, fellow feeling, sacrifice, uh, uh, let's say, uh, following the virtuous courses of life, all these are associated with Christ. But this image, embodies all, uh, doesn't embody all these values, but this actually is projected as an anti-Christ image, a rough fish. How do you know? Because yes is vexed to a nightmare. It is not that. Yes is uh, uh, physically repelled by the form of the creature, but yes thinks that all our waitings for 20 uh, uh, centuries, all this waiting for 2,000 years, all this waiting is a waiting in vain. It's our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. What rough uh, beast? Now, uh, the slouching towards, again, description of the uh, movement of the uh, 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 creature, very rough and uh, uncouth and uh, loathsome movement, uh, slouching, slowly moving towards Bethlehem to be born. So, 
Christ was born in Bethlehem, and this creature is going to, uh, let us say, um, uh, occupy the cradle of Christ at the end of 20 centuries. And this is not going to be a, 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 a happy replacement at all. Because uh, uh, we may say that if the child, if the beast in his child form could be so terrible, what nightmare would uh, wait for us when the baby grows up? So as if the beast in its present movement, it is just the trailer of a film, the main movie. If the trailer be so much, let us say, uh, uh, shocking and horrible to our eyes, then, uh, uh, then uh, let us say, uh, then what will happen to the world when this baby grows into uh, its manhood, when the baby uh, is full grown, then uh, the world will uh, be uh, thrown into a very uh, deep pit of darkness indeed. This is what he just wants to uh, convey to us. I think that I should uh, here stop for some time because uh, some questions have been posted uh, on the comment box, but in order to, in my hurry to uh, read the poem, I could not uh, address the questions. Uh, Vidhan or somebody, could you please uh, ask me the questions? I would try to respond to the questions one by one. The questions that have, uh, uh, have been uh, posted on the uh, chat box, could you please uh, bring to me the questions? Yeah. Uh, One or two okay. questions, the questions overlap. Uh, 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 question uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Hello? Am I audible to you? Am I audible to you, sir? Hello? Am I audible to you, sir? Hello? Am I audible to you, sir? Yes, Bidan, you are audible. You are audible to it. I think I can hear you. Yes, sir, you are audible to us. Yes, sir, you are audible. 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 Hello? Am I audible to you, sir? Hello? Bidan, you are not going to be able to hear you. Achha. Well, I am okay. Okay, am I am I audible? Trying to rejoin because I cannot hear anything. Okay, sir. Am I audible to you right now? Sir, कि जो सुनते बच्चन ना सर कि जो सुनते बच्चन ना कि जो problem हुए जब बुधवार. अच्छा अच्छा सर था ना आपने ये तो था ना एक बार rejoin कर बैंस है. विधान हाँ हाँ सर विधान हमारे पास की सुना जाच यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल अच्छा आमी प्रश्नों गुलो क्यों पोस्ट करें ची अमन आमी जो तक खून बोले ची शॉप टाइम सुना क्या ची हाँ यस सर यस सर ओके थैंक गॉड बिकॉज़ आई कूड नॉट हियर एनीथिंग um, that you are trying to okay. say. So, 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 so now you can uh, hear me, sir. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, okay. Uh, so, yeah, there are two questions that are uh, raised by one of uh, one by Somnath Mondol. Uh, let me introduce him. Uh, Somnath is a brilliant student of our department. Uh, he is uh, right now his fifth semester student. He has asked. Uh, does WBA's expectation of the coming Antichrist may come true in looking the contemporary critical situation of the world? The, the phrasing is not clear, but, uh, well, my, my, I have got the question. The question is, um, how prophetic is... Yes, uh, uh, you know, 
utterance or yes uh, anxiety at the end of expressed at the end of the poem yes it has a there is a prophetic utterance because as i told you that the antichrist historically may be related to hitler who hitler was rising at the end of the first world war as you know and the world was harder stripped in blood bath and horror during the second world war so in a sense it is property but don't relate it to the contemporary uh, you know second world war uh, and the other conditions that were prevalent in the um, uh, in the 30s of the uh, 30s and 40s of the 20th century but this is a universal poem and it can be related to any society even in our time we think that we are thrown in a pit of darkness and we have been waiting for a deliverer to come as if the deliverer may be if you are an atheist to you the deliverer may not be christ but maybe the a person like lenin or a revolutionary who will uh, deliver the world from the clutches of its uh, let's say present state from the clutches of the devil but the condition is all set and it can be related to any society anywhere in the world that is my response okay uh, thank you sir and the next question is uh, from vijay uh, shankar bhattacharya uh, let me introduce him uh, he is uh, an eminent uh, theater persona uh, he is from uh, Ashan Shul Bishari. Uh, his question is: Is destroy is uh, is destroy inevitable to create the new humanic world? Now, if you want me to respond, I will say that uh, violence is to be avoided. But uh, I remember a. Uh, saying of Mao Zedong, who once said, "You cannot make an omelet without breaking an egg." <laughs> so you uh, you cannot say. make an omelet without breaking an egg. And the present form is to be uh, uh, is to be let us say set right. The um, you know what do we call progress? Progress is the movement. movement can be done in two ways one is setting right or correcting what is wrong in our present society and setting wrong this can be done in two ways one is reform that is the condition will continue but you continue to improve upon the present condition and the other is you destroy there is an overhauling as happened in the during the french revolution or as happened in the russian revolution uh, so the present condition is to be set to not is to be destroyed and in kal boishaki mohitlal mojumdar you remember ori majhe ache novo vidhaner ashash dudhorsho it is the kal boishaki comes as a destroyer destroyer and preserver shall is the ode to the west wind so destruction is a precondition and i think i am not i no i believe in non violence no doubt but violent or non violent the old form must be let us say discarded if if, if we don't use the term destroy uh, destroy uh, because destruction that is a pejorative sense if the old form is not to be destroyed at least the old form is to be discarded in order to welcome the new so um, you know destruction in the bible it is said clearly that god will come and he you know, the when the world is stripped in evil then god will come and god will deliver us deliver us by how by limiting the power of the devil by uh, destroying evil as uh, you know if we, if we go by the biblical phrasing destruction of evil therefore is a precondition 
for the uh, rebirth, rebirth of a new system. So that's mm -hmm. how I would like to respond to the question. Uh, uh, okay, just, thank just, you, uh, sir. Uh, Bidhan, no. Bidhan, mm. uh, mm. uh, sir, just... Uh, just a small inquiry, if you kindly allow me. Yes, yes. Why not? Uh, uh, sir, uh, I'm Krishanu Adhikari. I'm also uh, an assistant professor here in, the, in this college of English department. The point is, that, uh, when Yates was writing this poem, uh, I think, you know, uh, this poem has also got some connotations, some, some, some underpinnings or, you know, relations with Irish nationalism. Uh, because in the wake of Irish nationalism, you know, this... The second coming, when Yates was all, uh, you know, was talking about uh, how to, you know, uh, 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 just uh, discard the uh, older world order in order to, you know, usher in a new, newer ones. So, uh, is there, is there anything, you know, is there any connection between this poem and uh, Irish nationalist movement? No, uh, my point is that it is presented in a so you presented in so uh, appropriate a manner that you can relate it to anything to indian situation to contemporary world situation to the let us say uh, jubilation of rightist force the uh, decimation of the jews during the second world war to everything to every condition you can relate whether it was directly related to or yes was, as I told you at the beginning, yes was very much responsive to the contemporary historical developments, the Irish freedom struggle, and uh, yes himself composed Eastern 1916 that centers on the massacre of uh, some Irish heroes, as you know, or rather anti heroes who. Uh, were powerless according to yes, but who due to this massacre, who had uh, been raised to a heroic stature, who are glorified, terrible beauty was born. So yes, was keenly sensitive to the uh, contemporary Irish situation. But whether this poem was uh, really inspired by any such uh, historical event, it is a generalized. It is a a description of the overall decadence marked by years in contemporary in his time all over the world, especially in Great Britain, United Kingdom. Maybe the Irish back, uh, situation was also at the backdrop of the consciousness, but whether it was directly inspired by any such event, I have not come across any such reference anywhere. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Please, Bidhan. Okay, uh, sir, I have a, I have a question. Uh, if I am allowed, uh, can no. I ask, sir? Yes, yes, uh, certainly. Why not? Uh, okay, actually, uh, sir, uh, diagram. When I look into the diagram of Jael, there are two spiral movements hmm. which are penetrating towards each other. So if I if I consider one of the spiral movement, the destruction or apocalypse, hmm, uh, the second coming of uh, Christ, then another one is also so far as Yates is concerned, he is trying to suggest here in this poem a new era is about to begin, which is characterized by barbarism, hypocrisy, murder or cruelty and everything. So, uh, then two era of destructions or two destructive dimensions are meeting together. So, is there any sign of reformation? And then, does this poem end with uh, an optimism or, or, or pessimism? Right? As you have uh, started with your, uh, your class today, you have uh, the, you have said about the similarities of Tagore and uh, Yates. Uh, Rovindranath Thakur, kintu that the Kovita gulo like even in crisis of civilization or uh, where the mind is without the Kovita gulo amra dekhechi it ends with a note of optimism or hope. Tagore has Tagore 
uh, gives his faith in humanism. Uh, but here, uh, does yet uh, give any any hope or optimism about humanity? अच्छा विधान एक टाइप है जो ऑप्टिमिज्म इट कूड बी ऑफ डिफरेंट टाइप्स सो अ डिफरेंट फॉर्म ऑफ ऑप्टिमिज्म प्रोबेबली अ डिफरेंट फॉर्म ऑफ ऑप्टिमिज्म फ्रॉम व्हाट वी हैव एनविजन्ड प्रीवियसली या जस्ट 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 आई जस्ट वांटेड टू ऐड दैट थैंक यू আমি যেটা মানে এই প্রশ্নের উত্তরে যেটা বলতে চাইছি সেটা হচ্ছে যে হ্যাঁ সেকেন্ড কামিং হবে এটা যদি আমরা ধরি যে অপটিমিজম যে সেকেন্ড কামিং হবে সেকেন্ড কামিং হতে চলেছে সেটা যদি হয় টোয়েন্টি সেঞ্চুরিজ অফ স্টোন ইসলিপ কিন্তু দেখো ভেক্স টু এ নাইট মেয়ার মানে এই সেকেন্ড কামিংটা কিন্তু আগের সেকেন্ড কামিং এর সঙ্গে একটা আমরা যার জন্য তৈরি আমরা যে শান্তি মৈত্রীর বাণীর জন্য তৈরি পৃথিবীকে রাখবো বা যে আশাতে এত অত্যাচার এত ধ্বংসের মাঝখানে আমরা অপেক্ষা করলাম সেটা কিন্তু একটা মানে ইয়ে হতে চলেছে সবকিছু সেটা হচ্ছে দুঃস্বপ্নে পরিণত হতে চলেছে তার মানে এটাকে কিন্তু ঠিক অপটিমিজম বলা যাবে না কিন্তু আমি তোমাদেরকে বললাম মানে আমি বোঝার চেষ্টা করলাম মা তোমাদেরকে বললাম বলাটা ধৃষ্টতা আমি নিজেও কবিতা থেকে অর্থ বার করার চেষ্টা করছি যে যে অ্যান্টিক্রাইস্ট ইমেজ বলে যাকে ইয়ে দেখাচ্ছে সেটা মানে ফিজিক্যালি সে শুধু অ্যান্টিক্রাইস্ট কিন্তু তার কাজটা হচ্ছে ক্রাইস্টের মতনই ডেস্ট্রয় করে দিয়ে নতুন সৃষ্টি করা কি না সে বিষয়ে কিন্তু ইয়ে সংশয় আছে মানে ইয়েস মনে করছেন ভেক্স টু এ নাইট মেয়ার মানে আমরা যার জন্য অপেক্ষা করছি আমি সেরকম নয় এ আরো ভয়ানক শক্তি হবে এই ভয়ানক শক্তি তাহলে এভরি হোয়ার দ্য সেরিমনি অফ ইনোসেন্স ইজ গ্রাউন্ড দ্য বেস্ট ল্যাক অল কনভিকশন তুমি যেটা বললে যে হিপক্রিসি ক্রুয়ালিটি এগুলোর বার বারন্ত হবে এগুলোর বার বারন্ত যদি এর জন্মের জন্য হয় সে বার বারন্ত হয়েছে বলে এ এগুলোকে মানে ইভিল কে কাউন্টার করতে গেলে আরো টেরিবল ইভিল কোন ফোর্স দরকার হয় সেই জন্য এই ক্রাইস্ট এই ফর্ম নিচ্ছে আমি যদি এই লাইনে ইন্টারপ্রেট করি তাহলে এটাকে অপটিমিস্টিক বলা যেতে পারে মানে ইভিলের এমন খারাপ অবস্থা হয়েছে যে তাকে আর যিশু মতো হচ্ছে মানে শান্ত সৌম্য এরকম ফিগার দিয়ে ইভিলকে এখনকার দিনে কাউন্টার করা যাবে না তাহলে এটা কিন্তু অপটিমিস্টিক একটা লাইন নেওয়া যায় কিন্তু আমার মনে হয় যে সেটা রিডিংটা বোধ হয় নয় কারণ বছরের যে আমাদের অপেক্ষা সে অপেক্ষাটা কি পূরণ হতে চলেছে ফিজিক্যাল ফর্মটা তো যাই হোক না কেন আমার এক্সপেক্টেশনটা ইজ ইট গোয়িং টু বি ফুলফিল বাট দি পোয়েম রেইজ ইস এ কোয়েশ্চেন দ্যাট এক্সপেক্টেশন ইজ নট গোয়িং টু বি ফুলফিল দেন the poem ends with a note of pessimism as well as if the poet is anxious that the future is going to be even bleaker yes so uh, maybe he is trying to counter the idea that uh, destruction is not all all the time uh, inevitable to create something new so here yeah, destruction is not you know anticipating any kind of creation কিন্তু ধরো তুমি ডেস্ট্রয় করছো কি নাকি তুমি এটাকে এনহান্স করছো ইভিল উড বি ফার্দার এনহান্স অর ইন্টেন্সিফাইড ডিউ টু দি প্রেজেন্স অফ দিস অ্যান্টিক্রাইস্ট ফোর্স ইভিল ডিস্ট্রয়েড হচ্ছে না ডিস্ট্রাকশন মানে ইভিলটা যদি একটা মানে ফার মোর ক্রুয়াল ফর্ম অফ ইভিল দিয়ে রিপ্লেসড হয় সেটা তো ডিস্ট্রাকশন হলো না ইন্টেন্সিফিকেশন হলো ইন্টেন্সিফিকেশন অফ ইভিল ইন্টেন্সিফিকেশন অফ ইভিল দিস ইজ হোয়াট মেক্স ইয়েস অ্যাংসার এন্ড দ্যাট ইজ হোয়াই দ্য পোয়েম ডাজ নট এন্ড উইথ ইন মাই মাইন্ড উইথ এন উইথ এ নোট অফ অপটিমিজম বাট ইট Hence, with a pessimistic note. 
thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I think we should now proceed for for the next session. Yes. Uh, next part of the lecture. Ah, ah, ah. Bidhan, are you there? Any question? Question? Ask me. Now, one two chat box. Try to see. No, one question. Ask me. Please. Both of you guys should do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Piyali Hajar, uh, second semester student. Uh, she has a question. The falcon third cannot third. hear the falcon. The third semester. Third, 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 third semester student. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Why does not the falcon come down when the falcon can hear the falcon? Here did yet try to portray the cars of civilization. प्रश्न परिष्कार हलो ना तब उत्तर देवार चेष्टा कर फालकन एवं फालकनारे बेपारुझते फालकन री मैं हाँ ओर बार्ड फ्लाइंग हिस्टोरिकल प्रैक्टिस से जानते हैं जे जो फालकन चोख गो के मैं चोख दिए तो देखी कत उच्चत उठल फालकनारे डनारे डाक जो कान पुछबेना अथच से बुझते नीचे दिखे तक कत उठते उठे से उठबे और उठबे उठे एक समय दुंगस उल गेट टायर्ड एंड इट उल Uh, be robbed of his power to fly, and it won't be able to come down. So, it is suggested through the image: the falcon cannot hear the falcon. That is, the uh, distance between the Lord and the devotee, the distance between the head and the heart. This is disjunction. That how I do know, and it is potentially destructive. Potentially ruinous, so we do not find integration here, but some kind of divorce. When the head is divorced from the heart, or man is uh, plucked away from the Lord, then the due to this disintegration, this disintegration is potentially ruinous. This is suggested by the image of falcon cannot hear the falconer. Hmm. Okay. So I think there are okay. There are no no many questions. So I think uh, we can move on to the next uh, part of the session. Okay. Now this poem, Lida and the Swan. Uh, this poem is uh, also a very powerful poem. Uh, In this poem, we find yes, as I told you, one feature of yes's poetry is that yes, uh, uh, always try to relate the personal to the historical, the historical consciousness, the social critical outlook on social condition. This is what is. very important and maybe singled out as one of the main features of yes's poetry lida and the swan this poem was also it is also a poem uh, taken from the uh, let us say second part of yes's poetic career when yes had uh, consciously changed his style and Had been uh, bidding farewell to the romantic past of Ireland and uh, sensitized his mind to the contemporary event. But here in this poem, yes, uh, has presented his views on the war, presented his uh, version of. Uh, An event that is uh, taken from Greek mythology. Those of you who are aware of the um, 
myth of Lida and the Swan. Lida was the mother of Helen. And um, in Greek mythology, it is said that God, the head God, I would say, Zeus, once uh, was attracted towards Lida and he visited Lida in disguise of a swan and mated with Lida. And the result is, there are many versions, but one version, two very acceptable versions are, one is, she lays two eggs. From one is born, Helen and Pollux, P-O-L-L-U-X. This is actually, these are the two children, two babies born from the seed of Jews when Jews had impregnated Lida and she laid another egg. From the other was born Clytemnestra and Castor. These are the uh, children born from the seed of her husband, her spouse, Tindereus, the king of Sparta, T-Y-N-D-A-R-E-U-S. So Tindereus, the king of Sparta, was the husband of Lida. And Lida was what we, in our time, we call it raping. Lida was virtually raped by Jesus. And you know that this gods in disguise, that is a very common thing in all literature. Uh, in fact, Plato in his Republic had condemned poetry for on many grounds. So one of the grounds is here we find that gods are in disguise and why should gods be in disguise? But there are many stories that gods visit mortals in disguise. In uh, uh, our culture also there are several uh, versions of gods visiting uh, uh, mortals. A whole last story you know. Uh, that was also a case of Indra visiting uh, Ahola in disguise. Uh, you know, and Durga, um, Annoda, Mongol, Kabbo, they are also a, 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 you know, a human form, but the difference is Jews, when Jews uh, raped Lida, uh, Jews visited her in the form of a, in disguise of a swan. Now, Helen, you know, was the wife of Menelaus. And Helen fell in love with Paris, who was a prince of Troy and a friend of Menelaus. And she eloped with Paris. And then the Greek pride was a heart. And the Greeks then attacked Troy. And there was a siege for siege of Troy for 10 years. And after that, the uh, uh, Troy had fallen and uh, Helen was uh, rescued. And the elopement of Helen resulted in the destruction of an entire civilization. The, not only the city of Troy, but almost the Trojan civilization was destroyed. And another girl child that was born um, from in the, in the womb of Lida, uh, that was the, from the seed of Tindereus, that was Clytemnestra. And Clytemnestra, you know, was the wife of the Greek hero Agamemnon, who, uh, after the fall of Troy, had Achilles had died, but Agamemnon returned, and Clytemnestra was by this time was in love with Aegisthus. And when Agamemnon came back after 10 years of fighting in uh, Troy, uh, he was assassinated by Clytemnestra and her paramour. These are the two incidents recorded in uh, Greek history or the version of Greek history that has come down to us. Now, yes, 
in this particular short poem, which is written in a sonnet form, Pierce gives us his own reading of history. He is focused on the incident of Lida being visited by Zeus, the head Greek head god, in disguise of a swan, and what was the result of this kind of uh, mortal immortal intercourse? Mortal, I don't call it uh, sexual union merely, because the way Yes has presented it, it is uh, not a just a, a sexual union, but it is a rape. Let us first uh, read the poem and then try to comment on some of the aspects uh, that can be, let us say, uh, uh, some of the obvious aspects I would say and some of the less obvious aspects uh, that uh, can be read into the poem. A sudden blow. So the word blow, it uh, immediately prepares our mind for some, because a blow is a hit, something hard hitting, a whack, something that, uh, let us say, comes to you as a, a kind of terrible shock, a sudden blow. The great wings beating still above the staggering girl. So the blow su suggests as if there is a uh, swooping. Lida was uh, a, a poor victim, a mere girl, a mortal girl. Zeus was attracted towards her beauty and Zeus had suddenly swooped upon S-W-O-O-P. With the ferocity, a lion would swoop upon a lamb. A sudden blow. The great wings beating still above the staggering girl. So staggering means uh, the girl was, uh, let us say, trying to uh, resist it. The girl was shocked by the event and trying to resist it. And she, however, uh, failed to resist the force because it was a, a brute, immortal force. Uh, the man cannot fight against a god. A sudden blow, the great winds beating still. So staggering literally means a leader was almost unprepared for it. It was a great shock to her. Staggered means one meaning of staggered is deeply shocked. Unpreparedness of leader. She was not at all, uh, you know, uh, prepared mentally or physically for such a uh, very discourteous visit. Thighs caressed by the dark waves had nape caught in this in his bill. So a physical description of the helplessness of a woman body in the clutches of a raping male force. So this one is a male force, her thighs caressed. Caressing is a form of love making, but here caressed means she has caught tight by the dark waves. Wave means actually the flat, uh, uh, you know, foot of a swan, the toes which are covered by one thin film of flesh. So the waves, the waves clutch her. Her nape caught in his bill. Bill, you know, is uh, the beak of a swan. So the nape means the neck of the girl. So a woman who is under the tight grip of a brute male force. This is uh, graphically described in the first stanza. Suddenly, that means a woman was unprepared. Imagine a girl who is unprepared suddenly. She has to suffer a sexual assault by a brute male force. 
So the force is more than, that means mightier than the frail soft girl who is presented as a victim here. The thigh is caressed by the dark waves, her nape caught in his bill, so caught in his bill. That means she cannot escape. So because of a, uh, let us say, uh, uh, superior physical force of the swan, because the swan was no swan, but the swan was uh, Jews in disguise of a swan. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. So as a result, the holding the breast upon his breast means the kind of close physical relation that is required, the physical contact that is required before sexual union that is presented here. So leader, a historical girl, the mother of Helen and Clytemnestra, visited by the swan. Swan is no swan, but Jews in disguise, suddenly caught unawares as if sudden blow, assaulted and not only assaulted, but gripped tight by the assaulting force. And how gripped the thighs of the girl, the poor girl leader, is held tight by the waves and her nape, neck is also held tight and there is a physical contact because the breast is, uh, his breast is upon her breast. Then he has uh, examined, in the past he describes the situation, then he again. How can those terrified egg figures, fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? So it is a rhetorical question, and uh, it prepares us for the uh, futility of protest. A girl uh, who is, uh, let us say, overpowered by this brute, superhuman force, uh, the girl is helpless. The helplessness of the ESC Ajib holding a brief for the helplessness of Lida. Yes, uh, sympathizes with Lida. Not that Lida didn't try to protest, but Lida failed to uh, resist the uh, failed to resist the uh, power of the uh, swan, that is the power of Jews. How can those terrified vague fingers? So Lida was terrified indeed because she was not prepared, nor was she, uh, was she mentally, nor did she relish mentally that she is being raped or she is being physically uh, as a, uh, assaulted by so uh, brute a force and not a human force but a, an animal force, terrified big fingers, it could not push away, push the feathered glory. So glory because it was after all Jesus and a uh, Jews and uh, juiced in the form of a swan, therefore he feathered, feathered glory from her loosening thigh. Loosening. Well, initially she tried to resist, no doubt, but uh, it was a uh, 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 this resistance in vain. So uh, she was collapsing before the uh, 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 before such a brute force, and this is suggested by the loosening thigh. And how can body laid in the white rush but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? So the body lies, she is being, uh, uh, the, the swan is in the state of physical union and Lida the sufferer and swan, Jews in disguise is the agent. And this is called a white rush. No, uh, rush means dash towards someone in order to occupy or capture. So again, the language of uh, uh, you know diction chosen by yes, it uh, gives us a clue that it was not a consensual sexual union. Now, you know, rape is uh, considered uh, um, by, you know, in modern 
way of looking at rape. Rape is non-consensual sexual union with a girl. So even if it is a sexual union between the husband and the wife, if the wife is not in, uh, doesn't consent to the sexual union, that is to be taken as rape and in, therefore in many civilized countries, non non-consensual sexual union with uh, a girl, even if by her husband, is considered a rape. And how the body uh, uh, stayed in that white rush, but feel, that means it can but feel the strange heart beating where it lies. So, uh, yes, it is marital rape. Uh, if it is non-consensual, and that is uh, uh, made illegal in many civilized countries. Now, uh, Lida had not given any consent to this sexual union. A shudder in the loins, shudder in the loins is uh, a physical uh, uh, movement, movement of the uh, let's say loins, the lower part of one's body at the time of ejaculation at the uh, time of the uh, discharge of uh, the semen at the end of sexual union on the part of a male. The shudder in the loins. Now this shudder means the semen is implanted. It, ejaculation has taken place. Whether it is orgasm on the part of the uh, uh, girl or not is not clear. But the brute male force has overpowered her and in, uh, implanted in her womb the seed of life. And yes, relates this personal, let us say, suffering of Lida to the uh, history. That means this union of uh, uh, Lida and the swan, or Jews visiting Lida in, the disguise, in disguise of a swan, this loveless union, it was a loveless union altogether, Lida, so uh, yes, thinks that Lida was a poor victim of this union, and but whatever be, love, uh, consensual or non-consensual, it was uh, uh, certainly non-consensual, whatever be the nature of the union, the implantation of the seed in her womb, engenders, means creates, generates there the broken wall, the burning roof, and tower, and Agamemnon dead. So, broken wall is the broken wall of Troy. That means it is what the personal is related to a history. The personal is related to a history, history of Troy, how, uh, you know, the Greeks occupied Troy for 10 years. They held a siege over Troy for 10 years and how ultimately the towers, the lofty towers of Troy fell and the broken wall, the devastation of Troy, the burning roof and uh, roof and tower in the city of Troy and Agamemnon dead. Because at the end of the victory of Troy, the Greek leader, the Greek uh, uh, so Captain Agamemnon returned to his own country only to be killed by, only to be assassinated by his own wife. So this is how the personal or rather a stray incident of an individual loss, loss in the sense because any rape is kind of uh, a woman robbed of her right to her own body. She is being dispossessed of her own sexuality. This is what we call rape. So, Agamem, all this is individual loss is related to uh, the uh, history because uh, the seed implanted there would later on be laid as egg, as an egg, and from that egg, uh, Helen would be born and Helen would be responsible for the destruction of Troy. So violence, physical violence that 
leaders of part that is related to the historical violence that troy suffered so troy and lida they are as if equated troy and lida they are that uh, two faces of the same coin as if so troy is here envisaged as a girl devastated by the greek soldiers as jews uh, had uh, uh, disposes lida of her own sexuality being so caught up so mustered by the brute blood of the air did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent be could let her drop now the um, expression indifferent be could let her drop this convinces us that it was um, a rape because the jews had no feeling for jews were interested in the gratification of his own sexual urge own sexual impulse only because once the ejaculation is over then jews becomes uh, indifferent the beak becomes uh, indifferent means it is transferred epithet of course beak is not indifferent jews is indifferent to the person leader could let her drop and let her fall like a dropping something like a, a, something that has been used you discard it you discards lida in that way now did lida was she at all aware put on his knowledge with his power so his power has been implanted then is physical presence of the seed of jews is in the womb of lida but did lida carry the seed alone or was she also uh, aware of the uh, event uh, that it created the history that it is going to this implantation is going to did she have any fore knowledge of the history making uh, conception that she uh, must suffer due to this union um, with jews this is all about the poem but let me explain it to you very clearly that uh, yes uh, has been interweaving many things here in a comment on the french revolution yes had said nothing is now possible but some movement or birth from above the preceded by some violent annunciations so any historical event or any event is a it opens up a new chapter in history and the word annunciation again is very important because annunciation in christianity it refers to the announcement made made by gabriel to mary you know mary was uh, a virgin and uh, she carried the seed um, and jesus was born and the christians believe that it is a birth a conception this conception in christianity is called immaculate conception immaculate conception means a conception that has nothing to do with sexual union so for with god nothing shall be impossible this is what you find in the annunciation in luke luke the gospel of luke so god can make the impossible possible that is without sexual union god can implant the seed and make a virgin conceive but here jews has been uh, has done it uh, not in a miraculous way but jews actually rapes uh, lida now as i told you lay, rape any form of rape is a violence and the way it is presented by uh, yes in the body of the poem it uh, uh, makes the intention that it is a violence that it is an outrage on a woman's right to her own body right to her own sexuality is clear now look at the phrasing blow an assault staggering means it makes uh, lida the unprepared lida very shocked caressed means crushed as if pressed pressed uh, very um, hard then caught 
fought by Wave and Bill. So Wave and Bill, the animality of the attacker is here uh, highlighted. Then the rhetorical question on uh, uh, about the helplessness of leader, loosening ties. You know, um, she is helpless before this brute force, succumbing as if. Then white rush, rush is dashed towards something uh, to attack it or to capture it. Then uh, shudder in the loins. All these actually. Now, uh, rape, it is a rape. But what is focused in the poem is not only the rape, but the result of rape. Rape is, uh, you know, when a rape occurs, not only an individual who suffers, a woman who suffers, but it also, um, uh, it also forms history. For example, this uh, this particular reflection on the uh, the how rape is related to a historical um, fact that the child born of this rape is the result of the uh, would be the cause for the destruction of a whole civilization. This is this reflection that rages the poem from a uh, short lyric about a rape to the height of a classical lyric. Now, mind it, that uh, the indifferent beak and uh, uh, rash, white rash, then blue, then waves, then nap, loosening thighs, these are graphic description of, uh, you know, this is actually a, a kind of description of the physical uh, process that is involved in a rape. And in all uh, this description, what is focused is the passivity of the woman. A woman who, uh, who is uh, absolutely helpless before and the uh, attacker here, the assaulter here uh, 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 comes to her not to make any love. Love making, once the love making is over, uh, love making means here, uh, the sex game. Once the sex game is over, now the juice grows indifferent to leader. So violation of a woman, violation of a woman's right to her own body, right to her own sexuality. This is what uh, makes the point uh, very relevant to our time. In our time also, we have come across every day, we turn the pages of the newspaper and we uh, find several stories of rape. Now, every rape is actually uh, to be uh, treated as um, uh, a kind of violation of the, um, uh, of the right of a woman. Not only that, but it is less an individual loss. Uh, individual loss in the sense that a woman is dispossessed of her own sexuality, but how it impacts society the whole society is as if impacted. Jews visited Lida, but that created a moment for the birth of Helen, who was responsible. So sexual violence is uh, not only physical and not only restricted to the moment, but what is important is impregnation. And this impregnation might impact uh, society in many ways. The woman may be, uh, let us say, discarded by the society. And the child born may be uh, uncared for, and the uncared for child may be may turn into a criminal in the days to come. So this is how we have to relate, to look at the entire. So it is a poem describing the violence perpetrated upon, inflicted upon the woman, and the interrelation of violence, rape, and the seize and fall of Troy. And uh, sex and violence. This is the relation of sex. Now, sex is a sweet experience to adult individuals, no doubt. But when sex becomes a violence, when you do not have any consideration for the, uh, uh, for the uh, let us say, expectations and feelings of your sexual partner, then uh, this sex is actually a brutish expression of your inner sexual impulse and it should not be 
described as a kind of sex that is befits a uh, befits humanity. So these are some of the aspects of the poem um, interrelation of rape and uh, you know individual and history interrelation of two forms of violence the violence at the individual level and uh, this paving the way for a violence that uh, might happen might take place uh, at a larger level in uh, history all these uh, distinguish the poem or rather make the poem a classic uh, poem uh, 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 written by es so this is uh, all i wanted to uh, let us say say in my short but because i am running out of time discussion now I, now i may take a few questions that might uh, be uh, let us say asked after my delivery and may respond to that those questions in my thank you sir thank you uh, the house is open for questions uh, in the meantime we have some questions and if few people have any other question you can unmute yourself and ask sir uh sir we have a question from shomnath sir does he imp imply that corrupted creator of christianity is the result of anarchy and the second question is can we consider this as a feminist poem corrupted i could uh, get that what is the question Uh, does he imply that corrupted creator of christianity is the result of anarchy and the second question is can we consider this poem as a feminist poem ask a question first corrupted creator of christianity christianity yes who is the corrupted creator of christianity yeah shomnath if you are present here you can unmute yourself and ask the question that will be better जुपिटर के Actually, okay, okay, sir. I I get it. I get it, sir. I get it. Jupiter was a Greek god, a Roman god, actually a head god, and Zeus uh, is the Greek head god. And in the in Roman civilization, Zeus came to be described as Jupiter. Whatever be that, Greek or Roman, this has nothing to do with Christianity because uh, Christianity. Uh, you know the religion that uh, we may trace back to the moment of the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, um, he actually preached a different faith. The Jews or Jupiter, the head, the Christ, you know, Christian pantheon and the Greek pantheon, they are distinct. Therefore, Jews cannot be described as a Uh, a christian a creator of balance or something like that as you described it is clear yes sir yes sir it is clear and what is the second question is it a feminist poem or something like that? yes 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 is it, can we call this poem as a feminist poem oh, what do we understand by the term feminism feminism is a uh, let us say a movement that um tries to uh let us say claim back the robbed power of women women who have been dispossessed of their rights by patriarchy patriarchy is a system where the males dictate and the females are to obey so feminism therefore is a, a movement or rather an ism that tries to 
claim back or that fights for the empowerment of women and one aspect of feminism is that not only there are several, several aspects for example at, at the beginning of uh, feminism in england it was a suffragette movement the right to vote that every adult woman should have the right to vote so voting originally it was claimed then equal rights no discrimination what we call a uh, gender discrimination no gender discrimination should be made same wage for the same labor etc these are some of the more let us say uh, uh, some of the demands in our time and also uh, equality of treatment equality of let us say rights and what do you mean by right our constitution has given all of us the equal rights everyone is uh, equal in the um, eye of law but constitution political let us say provision is one thing and social practices are uh, something other in social practice they are still women are othered and the feminist claim that one particular aspect of equality is that a male has a right to her uh, his own body a male has a right to his own sexuality he can dictate or he can govern it is perfectly under his control and whenever a rape takes place a rape is not a mere sexual union it is a violation of a woman's right and this has been uh, justly and i th- quite agree with this particular aspect that this has been justly pointed out by the feminist now in so far as we accept this proposition that a rape is a violation of the a uh, right uh, transgression of a woman's right to be the lord or to be the mistress of her own sexuality if that be feminist in nature in this poem we find women woman as a sufferer and therefore it is a uh, feminist poem obviously there are feminist uh, feminist reading of this poem is uh, possible but feminist or non feminist what is very clear is that a woman here is projected as a frail fragile victim before a brute male force and uh, you know that it is after all a loveless union because what was there any consent on the part of lida no it was non consensual union and was there any love on the part of zeus it is said uh, how do you define love love is a very uh, uh, an expression that is uh, who knows what love means but one way of defining love is that love is what survives when sex is gratified after the gratification maybe you come and ride upon a woman driven by your own sexual impulse but if you have some feeling for her sentiment after the union then that feeling may be described as love but what is presented here after the uh, end of the sex game zeus becomes indifferent he is indifferent big and he discards lida as if lida is a waste could let her drop dropping like uh, lida as a waste paper that means you use it and you then discard her so use her and then discard her and this is very objectionable and the feminists who have been fighting for uh, the rights of women they have been claiming that a woman's right to her own body a woman's right to her own sexuality should be uh, restored to her should be given back to her and if uh, we agree with this proposition then sort is indeed it is a feminist way this is my uh, uh, no 
how what i can say um how how i would like to respond to this question okay sir thank you sir thank you very much sir okay if any one of you have any other question you can unmute yourself and ask sir priya you may ask your question you can unmute you may unmute yourself and you may ask the question yourself is pali there पोएम अबाउट द the incarnation of it's Jesus. about the second coming it's about the second coming yeah this 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 question is from second coming that while it is a poem about the reincarnation of jesus why does it end with an antichrist figure this is her question sir no i explained it i told you that uh, reincarnation is clearly spelled out in the bible yes is working upon this uh, let us say biblical myth about the reincarnation of christ and the conditions he think are ripe enough for the reincarnation of christ the second coming of christ who will come as the deliverer of our people which has all gone to the dogs but the poem shows that it is not a second coming as we expect or as it is let us say described in the bible that second coming is going to take place some other person will use up the throne of god or the throne of jesus the cradle of jesus in bethlehem some other beast now in a uh, physical prowess and in intellectual sharpness it is let us say uh, a sphinx like figure but this is going to turn to not all our expectation for 2000 years so when we had been expect while we had been expecting for a the deliverer to come and put an end to all suffering yes Uh, let us say has a misgiving that all suffering is not going to end but the suffering is going to let us say uh, the degree of suffering is going to uh, increase the suffering is going to be intensified because we must prepare ourselves for more terrible uh, let us say form of suffering in the days to come thank you sir uh if there are uh, no more questions then uh, i think we can move on to the next uh, session of today's program shall we pidhan uh, yes 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 please um thank you so much sir uh, for your patience i am minakshi paul uh, assistant professor of our department uh, it was a very enlightening experience for all of us uh, to listen to you and i'm pretty sure that our students must have been benefited a lot by, uh, by such an erudite yet student friendly lecture of yours uh modern or the term modernism as dr ghoshal has pointed out in his lecture is a very deceptive uh and a very enigmatic term and that is why um, uh it invited so much of critical attention dr ghoshal has very beautifully pointed out the parallels between um yeats uh, and tagore yeats and eliot eliot and at the same time uh talked about the shared boundaries of romantic among romanticism victorianism and modernism so thank you so much sir uh first of all uh, i would like to thank 
the uh, faculty members of the Department of English for giving me this opportunity for delivering the vote of thanks for today's program. Uh, in the very beginning, on the behalf of our college and our entire department, I extend warm regards and great gratitude to the invited speaker of the day, Dr. Shukriti Ghoshal, sir, for sparing his precious time and enlightening us. Sir, we hope that uh, as the college reopens and uh, we get back to norma normality, uh, normality, we can have you in our college again and listen to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, we continue. Uh, I would like to uh, thank um, our respected principal, sir, although he is not present here. But without his support and guidance, this program uh, uh, could not have uh, been arranged. I also, I would also like to thank my two sincere colleagues, uh, uh, Krishanu Odhikari, assistant professor, uh, Department of English of our college, and at the same time, Mr. Vidhan Mondal, assistant professor. Department of English of our college. And at the same time, all the other faculty members uh, of our department, I would like to extend my deep gratitude to the technical committee uh, and the members, um, Mr. Shahmaj Shahbaj, Ahmed Mondol, uh, uh, Mr. Safikul uh, Alam, and others for their constant support uh, in arranging such virtual programs. So thank you. Sumit Kaur, Sumit Kaur and Indronil. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I should mention the name because they are today uh, there in the college and helping us out. Uh, Mr. Sumit Kaur, uh, Sect uh, Department of Geography, and uh, Mr. Indronil, Indronil Bhattacharji, Sect Department of Bengali. So uh, thank you all of you. Uh, last but not the least, I want to thank uh, the, all the students of our department because this program is after all for you. So thank you so much. And uh, tomorrow uh, is the last uh, day of this lecture series where we are going to have another uh, expert, uh, an erudite scholar uh, with us. So I hope all of you shall join tomorrow again. Thank you. I am a faculty member ছাত্র ছাত্রীদেরকে আমার আন্তরিক শ্রদ্ধা ভালোবাসা এবং অভিনন্দন জানাচ্ছি আমাকে আমন্ত্রণ জানানোর জন্য আমি ছাই পাস কি বলেছি সেটা আমি জানি না তবে চেষ্টা করেছি আমার মত করে বিষয়টাকে ছাত্রদের উপর করে তুলে ধরা ইট ইজ আপ টু देम টু ডিসাইড হোয়েদার দা টাইম ওয়াজ ওয়েস্টেড অর দা টাইম ওয়াজ এট অল ইউজড ইন সাম ম্যানার টু देम uh, nevertheless, I must thank you again for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to reread some of the classic poems of Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you thank for you enlightening so much, us sir. and enriching us with your uh, insightful lecture. And I have a team Honda Somoy WB yet can Complete picture is Corona poetry can ye among Duto poem ke in detail a uh, analyze Cora and it's very difficult and challenging. So, I mean, set up position Amra Kupode Sulam among Shamri Dolam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can leave then. Take leave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we will meet again tomorrow. At eleven. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.